Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to 66 Portland Place, the home of the Royal Institute of British Architects. My name's Alan Valance. I'm the RIBA's Chief Executive. On behalf of our President, Ben Derbyshire, and myself, I'd like to say thank you all for joining us here for the second of our RIBA Vitra Talk series. We're incredibly excited about this new program of talks, which showcases the best in contemporary established and emerging voices in architecture over the next two years. Leading architects will speak in events which take place here in London, across the UK, and also internationally with events taking place in Istanbul in Turkey. Our thanks to Vitra Bathrooms who are partnering the RIBA by sponsoring this prestigious series. And we're delighted again to have here this evening uh, the MD of Vitra Bathrooms UK, Levent Jure, Margaret Talbot, and some of the rest of the Vitra team. Tonight's event is a sellout. That's two from two. And we're also live streaming this event tonight on the RIBA's YouTube and Facebook channels. So a warm welcome out there uh, from all of us in here. We're thrilled to be joined this evening by Sir David Adjay in conversation with Leslie Locko. Leslie will introduce Sir David in a bit more detail shortly. But it goes without saying that we're delighted to be in the presence of one of the world's 100 most influential people, according to Time magazine in 2017, and in fact the only architect on the list. As many of you might know, David is this year's chair of the RIBA Sterling Prize jury, Sterling Prize being our most prestigious award. We've been keeping the jury very busy over the last 72 hours. They've been to Cornwall, Cambridge, Hertfordshire, London, uh, and back here into Portland Place this evening. The Sterling Prize judging is nearing its conclusion and the event itself, the Sterling Prize, will be held on the 10th of October at the Roundhouse, uh, a fantastic event uh, venue. A gala affair with the announcement being covered but live by the BBC as our media partner. You can still get tickets if you go to architecture.com. Apologies, I had to give that plug or the team would have killed me if I didn't. Talking of which, I'd like to just thank a couple of members of my team here at the ROBA, in particular to Manisha Kelly, Mika Jones, uh, and to other people around the organisation who are working so hard behind the scenes to put these sorts of events on. Tonight, Sir David will be in conversation with Professor Leslie Locko, an architect, academic, and the author of 10 best-selling novels. Leslie's currently the head of the Graduate School of Architecture at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. We've also been keeping Leslie busy this week as she's kindly participated in the RIBA's dissertation medal judging with our education team earlier uh, on this week. A couple of points of housekeeping before we begin. You're very welcome to keep your mobile phones on, but if you could please turn them on to silent or vibrate, that'd be terrific. If you are a social media user, please feel free to tweet and Insta post as if your very lives depended on it. The hashtag for the events tonight is hashtag RIBA Vitra. We don't have a fire alarm planned this evening, but if you do hear the fire alarm, it's the real thing. And the exits can be found over to my left and at the back, and our staff will assist you. 
Without further ado then, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Sir David Adjaye and Leslie Locker. glasses on. Thank you to Manisha, Alan, um, Vitra and the RABA for this really amazing opportunity to engage with Sir David in this way tonight. Under normal circumstances, it's a bit of a risk to invite two Ghanaians to the um, stage, <laughs> since we will never stop talking. <laughs> but we've done this once before, so I can promise you that we're not going to be here until midnight. And I'm especially pleased to have the very rare opportunity to hold a public conversation with Sir David. So it affords both of us, both the audience and the narrators, a rare opportunity to go behind the facade of a successful practice to what lies both beyond and behind. And as I said, we've done this once before in Johannesburg in front of my Vice-Chancellor, whom I don't think had ever attended a lecture on architecture before, much less an architecture lecture by Sir David. And he was so impressed that he made a public financial commitment to the GSA on the spot, for which I will always be grateful. And it also left him deeply astonished to learn what it is that architects actually do, far beyond the technical challenges of a building. And on the one hand, it's moved him enough to award David with an honorary doctorate from the University of Johannesburg, but it also gives him and I something to talk about whenever we meet. And he always starts by saying, well, how is the world of architecture and how is David? Please send him my regards, and it's his only line of conversation, but it's proved very effective when I need money, so thank you. <laughs> And when I introduced you back then, if that's the right word, I think I actually reintroduced you would be more accurate because you're somebody that you know, everybody already has an opinion. I described you as someone who is always aware of the complexities and contradictions of heritage, but who also has the grace to embrace those complexities and contradictions as if there were simply no option to do otherwise. And grace is not a word that we use very often anymore. It has an old-fashioned ring to it. But it's a word we could certainly use much more of, particularly in contemporary life. Obama had it in spades, and you certainly have it, particularly and perhaps most especially in your public and civic work, where the ability to hold complex, transform ideas and sometimes contested histories into experiences of shared spatial joy is at its most profound. And I think tonight's audience is very different to the audience we had in Johannesburg, so I'm going to ask slightly different questions. And for one thing, it's hard to overstate the importance of having an African architect of your caliber in the room, so to speak. So in a sense, it would hardly have mattered what we spoke about um, for most of the students there, because sheer pride um, overtook almost every other emotion. But tonight, most people in the audience will know the broad outline of your biography, so I'm not going to repeat things that everybody knows or can find on, on Google. But instead, I'm going to ask a number of questions that center around your practice, your design processes, and your personal ambitions in a way that I hope is more discursive and less scripted than a straightforward lecture. So I want to begin this evening's um, talk with a line borrowed from Mabel Wilson's remarkable book on the Smithsonian Museum, Begin with the Past. And I'm going to go way back to 1990 and to your RIBA President's Medal win. And John Paul was kind enough to send me some archival images of your your win, and you looked so young. <laughs> so did Max Hutchinson. But it was probably South Bank's first win, and I think you were the first African or African-born winner. And how significant a moment was that for you? Um, thank you, Leslie. And you, you can just call me David. <laughs> you can drop. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's wonderful to be at the RIBA speaking to you and to be in this kind of conversation. Um, the, I think the RIBA bronze medal was the kind of moment that um, the whole thing started to make sense for me. Um, and it was a very strange moment. You know, I remember having to wear a suit that was bigger than myself and sort of standing there, sort of in my little, um, it was, I think it was my, I kind of went and bought an Izumiyaki suit because I'd always wanted one at that time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you looked incredibly proud. <laughs> <laughs> very proud moment. Uh, my, my parents were very and my parents suddenly realized that this was something that I had a passion about. But I, I think that that, that <laughs> and, I, and I don't say that flippantly, <laughs> um, it was, uh, I, you know, it, it, was not, it was not easy to kind of explain why I was spending nights and days kind of drinking whatever I was drinking to keep myself up to do the work that I was doing. And it was just ex incredibly rewarding to get that prize at that time. So um, it, it gave me a kind of confidence internally um, because in a way, it, 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 
it was the first external acknowledgement that, yeah. that there was something. And you know, the project was really a, a project for me that was deeply personal. It was really a kind of slightly biographical, autobiographical yeah. in the sense that it was about my brother. Yeah. And it was about this idea of creating respite centers within the urban or suburban or urban communities yeah. as a, a topology that would not sort of try to make that um, user group feel as though they were different from society. Um, and it was just wonderful to, to get mm. that response. I mean, I'm going to ask something about the, um, the mm. project itself. And it was a respite gen um, center, as you said, for children with physical and mental disabilities. Mm. And you had first-hand experience of that through your brother. Mm. And he'd been sent to a, a center in a badly converted Victorian house. And you've spoken before, I think, you know, many years ago, about how your attraction to architecture was born out of desperation, not inspiration, at yeah. seeing how a building could fail in its task. Yeah. And I wonder if that sense of anger or that sort of challenge to architecture to do better or to be better is still with you? I think that um, if it wasn't, I would, I would give up. I think that my, of course I'm inspired by very beautiful things, but I think that I'm, I'm more horrified by the inability mm. um, uh, or the kind of complexities that are placed on people because of the kind of loaded codes that architecture is sometimes kind of sets up or the lack of codes even. Mm. So it's, it's, it's not in any direction. And I think that this, that, this idea of a kind of um, a, a, a passion to, to insist on things being better mm. um, is, the, is, the, is the thing that actually um, drives the entire agenda. Because there's a certain point where, you know, it's, it's no longer just about construction or about building topologies because that, you know, if you can last a certain amount of time, you hopefully will yeah. get through quite a few of those things. But um, uh, there's a moment when um, you sort of have to ask yourself the question, is it just about um, continually just the, the kind of author's idea of searching for some kind of perfection? Or is it something else? And for me, it's not about searching for a perfection, but it's about the idea that architecture is constantly required to remake the world. Yeah. The world is permanently failing through the, the built forms that we make. And that architecture is a is a constant dialogue with remaking the world, mm. and 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 I really believe that deeply, even more so now. I mean, I think it's Mark Wigley who says something about you know it, it sounds hokey, but in every single architect, there's the kind of hope that things could be done better, and so it's a, it's a sort of professional optimism. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the bit where you know if if your tutor says to you, you know it's not really a profession, it's a kind of vocation. I think yeah. that's what they mean. Yeah. But there is, of course, you can be a professional and it's a great career path and all that sort of stuff. But it's, at its heart, it's about you know, trying to, to make a better world. Hopelessly romantic. To go back even further, yeah. I mean, you've also talked about how travel made you aware of the outside world in terms of its built environments. But being exposed at a very young age to climate, for example, yeah. made you aware in a kind of bodily, almost visceral sense yeah. of the world outside, things like heat and cold and light and shadow and so on. It's a kind of awareness of architecture as a mediating device before you could even think of it as architecture, a bit like you know, the way a child hears sound before they understand it as language. Yeah. Was that literally how it was for you? I, I think that you, I mean, that is the profound um, sort of awareness for me of architecture. And to be a young kid in the sort of, in the, born in the late 60s and growing up in the early 70s and 80s and having to move from the equator to, mm. to the north, um, and having to go through forests, you know, mm. deserts, sort of savannas, and to the sort of the mixed kind of um, sort of ecologies of Europe and the kind of northern climates was profound in mm. terms of a physical um, Reaction, sort of yeah. mental uh, map that was kind of imprinted on me. And in a way, I I I kind of really started to understand the kind of the power of architecture through that kind of climatic kind of journey, journey yeah. and it, it's you know it's very different to going on holiday um, to for a child to be imprinted in a place where it's extremely hot yeah. all the time or it's extremely wet and physically wet you know the yeah. air is or to be in a place where there's a kind of uh, extraordinary cold you know um, and and these are kind of like uh, sort of so in a way for me the kind of the way in which geography um, <coughs> It, it, for me, is the kind of the, the very essence of what architecture kind of does was very early, mm -hmm. subconscious at first, but always 
very much in the way the work was pro producing itself and then much more conscious as I started to mature. Mm. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but you had quite a nomadic childhood, not just because your father was a diplomat, but also because of the political instability in, in our Absolutely. home country, Ghana. Yeah. And at numerous points in the 70s and 80s, there were waves of emigration out of Ghana, not just of the professional classes, but actually of anyone who had the means to leave. And, and do you think that in some really deep way, your attraction to this discipline has also been its ability to root or ground yourself, to, to make a, a literal home in some way? I, I that's, that's, that's throwing me. <laughs> I, I think that that's a fascinating question. I mean, we're in the realms of um, psychoanalysis. psychoanalysis. <laughs> I, I probably am desperately trying to make a home continually, yes. I mean, I'm sure that there is a kind of, I think that every creative impulse is a kind of reaction to some kind of, um, kind of condition that you're trying to eternally kind of, you know, deal with, I'm sure. Um, is it a home? Yeah, maybe there is a kind of, maybe I'm trying to use architecture as a kind of stabilizing device mm -hmm. in a kind of world that was continually in flux. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I can admit to that. I don't know if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I often wonder about this sort of, sorry, but no, this no. connection between migration mm. or displacement in architecture. And we tend to think of architecture as having a rather abstract social or, or sort of political um, responsibility to contemporary social challenges like mm. migration. But we rarely speak about the emotive or the, the kind of intuitive responses to migration that come from first-hand experience. Yeah. That, that I suppose in some way we try to resolve through architecture. And I'm wondering here about the Smithsonian project, and it's a slightly tricky question, but I wonder if you felt the pressure of designing for a history slavery that you're connected to, certainly, but you're not actually a part of. So you're African, not African-American, at least not in the strict historical sense. And I think like Obama, yours is a slightly different history. Were you aware of that difference? And, and did that ability to be both inside and outside an experience simultaneously allow you a certain kind of creative freedom in that project? I think that that project, which is a sort of a very important project in terms of um, my kind of ability to, um, uh, my kind of this opportunity to have been put in a position where not, not just authoring kind of architecture as a kind of built form, but having to also negotiate this very complicated terrain um, uh, um, really taught and instilled a certain kind of um, sort of way of thinking and looking at working which um, which I probably had subconsciously but had not formally kind of uh, sort of expressed and in a way I think that what I what I mean is that yes there is a certain ability that maybe the outsider can read a condition mm. in a in a in a you know people would say objective way I don't think it's about objectivity I think that it's interesting that um, uh, this, this, the thinking is that somehow, because I'm um, West Af you know, of West African heritage, that somehow it wouldn't be connected. Um, in a way, for me, it was deeply connected because um, the data shows that West and Central Africa is exactly where, you know, going on to 30 million slaves are extracted from the continent, and 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 a, a huge amount, you know, of those who survived, you know, um, there's only something like whatever it is, I think 15 million or something that went to South and North America. And in a way, when you see the diaspora, you realize from Kingston, Haiti, Salvador, to it's, it's a kind of West Central African culture that's mutated and hybridized. Um, and I, I found it kind of very funny that, you know, I mean, immediately in terms of the political and national history, of course I'm not African American, but it's really, for me, a story about the African diaspora. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I felt very comfortable with the conversation and felt great empathy with it. Mm -hmm. um, not that you need empathy to, to do architecture, but, you know, it allowed a certain way in which, for me, the narrative was very clear. Um, when we won, essentially because all the other teams were essentially focusing either on the idea of the mall and making a building to finish the mall or on the trauma of, of, the, of the story. Yeah. And, and, and from where I was standing, I said that um, our, the narrative was, this was an extraordinary achievement of, you know, uh, of a group that were born in bondage, essentially, and have got to a sort of stage where, you know, um, as hopelessly bad as the situation is, um, have managed to kind of somehow integrate 
and create an identity, a hybridized identity, at this incredible um, uh, uh, sort of affliction. Um, and, and those are my, you know, if I'm connected to my ancestors, I'm connected to them. Mm. <laughs> Which way, how do you kind of, how do you connect, how do you say this direction is correct and this direction is not? I mean, we're, it's all one sort of thing. Um, and so this idea of the narrative of the building for me was, was to see if, you know, it was the mo first moment where there was, it seemed like there was a kind of crack in, this, in the way in which architecture could be made and one could finally kind of speculate on what an architecture could be um, if there hadn't been this kind of history, at the same time as wanting to make a building that was acknowledging that history. So it was a kind of very extraordinary kind of moment um, where um, the, the opportunity of the, being the last building on the mall, you know, this group fighting for 200 years to kind of get this thing done, and, and this idea of what is it, because in the end, it can't just be a museum, even though it was about museums. Mm. It, it sort of had, because it was last and had been, had been through this extraordinary journey, it was at the same time a memorial to the kind of story. It was, and it was also, in its, in, its, in its very essence, a kind of monument as well for a group of people who felt completely um, um, dislocated from a, a central narrative which was supposed to be their narrative. And with no architecture or any kind of hinge that made them feel that they contributed in that way. So it's the African American experience is one of a kind of very much a South African experience of being mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the servant in the back, yeah. but never visible in the front. And so in a way, making a building f for that community, and it was extraordinary to see the kind of reactions, is, was very much about how to kind of become visible mm -hmm. in a, a world that wanted you to be invisible and to dissolve. And, and, and how to kind of, not to make that a kind of us and them racial issue or anything like that, but how does that become a kind of statement about world knowledge and civilizations and value systems that can all contribute to a better understanding of how we, we all live with each other mm -hmm. and how we kind of make architecture for each other. Um, and so that's, that became that, this very kind of extraordinary conversation internally with my team, with the consultants, sometimes with Congress, with a whole bunch of lawyers, and, um, and it had to be vocalized because the building the, the kind of fortune that you have as an architect to work privately, but to somehow make presentations, was taken away because mm. every move was scrutinized. No this was not a kind of, oh, he got away with it, you know, oh, that details my little, mo like every bit of the building had to be discussed um, and, and thought through. So, and, and what it did it was that it made every part of the building be part of the narrative. It wasn't just a circulation stair, it wasn't just a side. Area was like what 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 does it do what does it do what does it mean where are we um, and that was really um, a sort of an extraordinary crit if I can say call it a crit I thought I had terrible crits when I was at school but it was like you know you ha you're presenting to Congress yeah. Congress <laughs> senators both Republican and Democrats or to Oprah Winfrey and Colin Powell you know and and they're sort of looking at you like what does that mean. <laughs> So, but I suppose yeah. I think that's kind of what I'm getting at is mm. that for some the burden mm. of that position can threaten to completely overwhelm the, well, the kind of creative gesture but your ability to stand both inside and outside the situation I think also allows you to take distance from it and in that distance a narrative emerges. Yeah, I mean I think that either naively or I, I just never ever looked at the um, the trauma of the commission. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. felt like I, that wasn't even something that I could even have a discussion in, with myself about until the end. I think I really didn't really consciously think about it until the end. I mean, I was just more scared of not being able to deliver it. Mm. That was profoundly mm. the fuel. Like, this has to be delivered, and, and we have to find ways to deliver it. So I, I want to read something um, that was written by Zora Neale Hurston in mm. 1928, about 90 years ago, and it's a little long, so I'm going to condense it to the main points, even though I'm, I'm sure you already know it. Mm. And it starts, when I sit in the drafty basement that is a New World cabaret with a white person, my color comes. We start chatting about any little nothing that we have in common and are seated by the waiters. And in the abrupt way that jazz orchestras have, this one plunges straight into a number. It loses no time in circumlocutions, but gets right down to business. My pulse begins to race, throbbing like a war drum. The sound constricts my throat, and it splits my heart. 
I want to slaughter something, give pain, give death to what I don't know. I lose myself entirely. But the piece ends, the men of the orchestra wipe their lips and rest their fingers. I creep back slowly to the veneer of civilization with the last tone, and I find my white friend sitting motionless in his seat, smoking calmly. Good music they have here, he remarks, drumming the table with his fingers. Music, the great globs of purple and red emotion have not touched him. He has only heard what I have felt. He is so far away, and I see him but dimly across the ocean and the continent that have fallen between us. He is so pale with his whiteness, and I am so colored. And I read this when I was still a student at the Bartlett in the 90s, struggling with a discipline that seemed to have no place for otherness, and it set me free, literally, this piece. And for the first time probably ever, I understood race to be a creative force, something that I could draw on to express myself in material, formal, or even visual terms. And you've said in the past, and I quote, Africa is important to me, not in any political way. I just feel a little exhausted looking at Rome and Greece, quite frankly. And it seems to me that both reactions come from the same place, a desire to find meaning in difference, yeah. whether racial, cultural, linguistic, or whatever, that can be productive, not reductive. Would yeah. you agree? Completely, completely. I mean, I mean and I think that um, the, the discourse, I mean, it's sort of, I said it in a kind of very sort of light way or trying to sort of, so, I mean, I love, of course I love um, the architecture of the antiquities. Um, I just, I think what I hate is the editing of history, mm -hmm. editing of contributions, mm -hmm. and the idea that somehow some things are lost because of power. Um, and I, I kind of, you know, deeply desire a world where knowledge is above power, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and I think that, that that becomes a very fulfilling world for a, a person to be in. Um, and so this idea of um, always looking to sources mm -hmm. and to the roots of things is at the, is at the base of the, of the, of the studio, and to, to a point that it's not something that's just casually done. We have, a, we have a research team that's actively always mining things or working with me on the books or um, the sort of book themes that we're working on or, or just working with the projects, um, mm -hmm. the project architects and the directors directly on, 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 on work. And, and you know, that, that idea that somehow we don't just act with a kind of an assumed body of knowledge, but that we're continually questioning what that body of knowledge is and, and, is, and questioning how we bring that knowledge to a work is, is a critical part of the tension that I insist on in the office. And it's a tension deliberately because it's a tension to not, you know, some offices want to kind of find a pattern, a style, a technique, and, and then yeah, and develop it and off it goes. I'm sort of interested in uh, an office that continually has to keep learning. So it's, it's not um, it's, uh, it's It means that you're exhaustingly always having to start from the beginning. beginning yeah. And you're all, always thinking about what the details can be. And, but I, I profoundly believe in that as a method to, to, to make the, the, the act of making architecture always a kind of sacred thing. Yeah. Like, in the end, it's a kind of extraordinary responsibility to make a, a structure that will affect thousands of people's lives. I mean, yes, you could just, you know, assume that you've, as long as you get it through the regs, you know, you've more or less done your job. But I mean, in a way, I think that there's something very kind of profound about the act. And so the idea of always, um, you know, being very present in what the thing could be, no matter what, how lifted or how uh, incredible the budget is, because it's really nothing to do with the, pre the budget, it's to do with the kind of ability to kind of have a certain kind of consciousness in the project that kind of allows it to transcend its ability to just get through the regs or just to be technically to be proficient. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that, what I call the consciousness in the project, is, is, a, is a very important thing to always teach the studio, because studios tend to quickly become systems. Yeah. Um, and I think that if, it, if, if, for me, I think if practice became that I would switch off, I would stop being an architect, that this idea that uh, there's always a question um, to be answered um, is, is very much part of the, the reason for doing it. I mean, sort of following on from that a bit, you, you've managed very successfully to confound um, expectations by an almost innate refusal to be pigeonholed or to develop a signature you know, style by which your work can be identified. And if you think about the major works, you know, everything from Dirty House in 2002, Rivington Place and the Stephen Lawrence Center and so on, right through Moscow to, to the completed Smithsonian, it's not really possible to draw a kind of line or a thread 
um, yet they do share a sort of sensibility. And, you know, how would you describe that sensibility? What would you say is the DNA the de of the work? The, the DNA of the work is the, is the thinking process. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I basically insist on um, the, the resolution of the building is not, you know, I think it's very, very much a very 20th century kind of, or a, a history of architecture hangover that somehow the work is, you know, in the end somehow um, only residing in the, the sum of the brickwork. Well, I, I contest that. I think that it is that architecture, the making architecture is the act of actually making drawings. The act of making drawings is a kind of language and a narrative. It's a coded language that people can speak, but it is a language. It is a kind of, way of writing. And the idea that somehow um, the architecture resides in the artifact only is something that I question. Mm -hmm. you know. So I'm going to move um, the question slightly, but the American rapper, his name is Young Thug, who's also known as Jeffrey Lamar Williams, once said, we need money, we need hits. Hits bring money, money bring power, power bring fame, and fame change the game. Famous lines. <laughs> How has the game changed for you? Um, the game has changed in that, um, that I'm getting asked by incredible institutions to do projects. So, I mean, when I started, I, I, you know, I would do anything from, you know, designing a set for Chrissy Hines for a video to, you know, doing a, you know, a, a truck stop cafe. Um, and I actually still find those kind of things interesting, so that we all sort of do sort of very strange little projects um, that people think, why are you doing that? But it's just to kind of engage always, but also at the same time, you know, now one is, you know, for instance, working in Ghana with a project that's sort of behind us, conceiving of an idea of what is the kind of sacred space of a country, mm -hmm. um, um, or what can be a shared communal idea of a kind of sacred space for a country. So, and that is sort of a dream, a dream project. Um, and, you know, it hasn't been a straight, it hasn't been a kind of easy mm -hmm. path to that. It's, you know, uh, you know, I, it's been interesting seeing that actually the work that I've been doing and the work that I haven't been getting has actually allowed me to be, to be more focused about the kind of work that I'm now getting, right. if I can say that. So yeah. in a way, the fact that I didn't win and didn't build certain kinds of commercial work and certain kinds of projects, not because I didn't want to, because I kind of always knew that I was interested more in the kind of the, the public part of architecture, but just to make a practice in the 20th, 21st century requires you to kind of have cash flow and you end up doing buildings that you kind of, you know, mm. kind of don't really careful but you do because and for some strange reason I've been lucky enough to not have any of those kinds of projects happen um, so it sort of always forced me to sort of work within the cultural sector or within the, um, the education sector and uh, in a way that honed my skills and to the point that now that is the kind of heart of the, pro of the so 20 years later yeah. somehow by some strange coincidence it's become the thing that we've now become known for and it's become the thing that actually is the the dream that I had about what architecture could be. Yeah. yeah. So it's so what's nice is that I mean what's kind of amazing is that we are now able to be in that moment. Mm. There are not many of those projects around the world and it's forced a kind of global practice, not because I want a global practice. I have no interest in large numbers of staff or big mm. turnover. I find that actually deeply off putting. But it's it's this idea that somehow one will follow you follow the work rather than making the work. work yeah. yeah. And I mean Staying with that idea yeah. for, a min for a moment, Hans Rosling also wrote that fame is easy to acquire, but impact is much more difficult. Absolutely. And I, I'm not going to ask if you desire or, or you have achieved impact. I, I think and, you know, we both know you have. But I do want to ask if you think that one is a prerequisite for the other, or you know, can you have one without the other? Is it a kind of Faustian pact? <laughs> I, I think that um, it depends on who you are and, and what world you live in and what world you come from. Um, I think that for, for people of color, um, one of the ways to get to a level playing field is through fame. Mm -hmm. To have the kind of freedom to just be who they are. But that kind of requires the Faustian pacts that you yeah. outline because it means you're sort of trapped. And so there's a sense that somehow you desire that. But actually what you desire, if you're really a creative person, is the freedom to be creative. Yeah and not to be continually having to put who you are up and then yep. you know, what you can do and what you 
Whereas if you live in a world of privilege or a certain kind of acknowledgement, yeah. you can run through the system without doing that. Yeah. Because the system is designed for you to be able to do that. So it's a kind of dilemma. So it's not quite about fame, it's about the ability to get to the point where you can creatively just be free be, to, be to do yeah. what you want to do. That's a really good, really good point. And I mean, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the projects you've done over the past 20 years, and, and to begin with a rather poignant one, mm. which is the House for Kofi and Nana Annan, which was also your first, I think, the first commission in yeah. Ghana. And I remember the four of us sitting at White Sands Resort in, in Gomwa Fete just after they'd bought the, the land. And I remember ordering a chicken sandwich and thinking it was one of the most surreal days of my life, you know, eating a chicken sandwich with the head of the UN and yourself and his wife. But we talked with Nana about her desire for a private family space in what was essentially a very public life. Mm. And what was that like as a project, both the kind of process, but also the added weight of those particular clients in that particular location? I think that um, the Anand project really for me um, was incredibly important because I think that at the kind of the scale of the private or the, the residential, um, there's, a, there's a kind of, you enter this very private space and personal space and you know, when you're making housing, it's one thing. You don't have to enter into that private realm, but when you make a house for somebody, so it can be all about kind of money and gimmicks, but it can also then be about the kind of very core of what you, the person might be interested in wanting architecture to do for them. Mm. And, and I think for Kofi Annan, if I can use their names like that, um, this idea of, for Kofi of being able to come back to Africa mm. and to have a home that wasn't just a kind of simulation of a European or American home mm. was profoundly important to him. Mm. And finding an architect who could work with him to have that conversation. And it, it worked for me in the sense that I just completed the analysis of the continent, which took me a decade to kind of do, and just replaying the, geo the idea of the geographies and cultures. And so I kind of came to him with this idea that, I, you know, one, I was totally probably not the best person to give him a wonderful, luxurious house, because um, there are so many architects that can do that. Um, but I was very interested in this idea of seeing if we could use the house as an opportunity to try and discuss ideas about um, being near the equator and being on that coast and being of you know Cape Coast and Kumasi um, ethnicity, returning back mm -hmm. after living in Switzerland and New York, um, and it was it was profound for me because with that with him and Nan who's from Sweden but was very much kind of oscillating with this idea of a being being in Sweden being in Africa. We were able to, you know, have this conversation about, you know, well, what, what first is the idea of the respite mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. um, and and how does the architecture, how does the architecture need to make the frame to kind of support that, and you know, in the end, it ended up making a house that is deceptively simple in the sense that it, it returned back to it's the kind of classic thing of the sort of billionaire who, you know goes and earns all the money in the world and ends up becoming, wants to have a, you know, live on a boat or something, you know, like a fisherman who says, like, go out on my boat every day. But, like, so he basically, in the end, we wanted to get back to a place where none of the codes, none of the codes that codify who you were and what things are would register, mm -hmm. that you could just be in a space that was completely elementally connecting you to your environment and your landscape and would, and that the architecture would absolutely be the device that moderates the climate. Um, and so in the end, the house, as you saw, is, is made with no materiality except for the concrete which is dyed with the earth colors from the local region and is completely, the entire effort is to, to you know, you need functional things, bathrooms and things like that, but they are absolutely brought into, not a kind of minimalist kind of uh, way of kind of trying to, you know, hide things but to kind of reduce the complexity of what a house could be so that it simply became a series of platform shelters that yeah. you would inhabit with nothing more disturbing you in it. And it was deeply powerful to speak to a man like that about that and you know, it became the place that he ret re returned to yeah. as a kind of quiet space um, that he, you know, and, that was, and it, it sort of in a way activated um, how I wanted to make architecture in West Africa. I mean, it's, it's also very interesting because the, the house is situated very close to a beach resort, 
which is the complete opposite. It's the complete kind of pastiche yep, right. of, of Africa. So you have these yeah. two kind of worlds. examples, these two worlds literally side by side. Yeah. No, there's um, the kind of luxury, yeah. luxury boutique hotel with yeah. the manicured landscape. And, yeah. um, and a fake thatch. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, it sometimes comes as a surprise to people to learn of your interest and, and your commitment in public housing projects, particularly in the US. Mm. And I'm thinking of the Sugar Hill um, um, project in particular. Yeah. And in Johannesburg, your, your project in Mamaneng has drawn fire, most notably from, architect, from architects, mm. for whom the word gentrification is like a red rag to a bull. Yeah. But one of the interesting things in a city like Johannesburg, and to a certain extent, I think, Harlem, is that where race and class intersect, there are no easy or straightforward answers. Mm -hmm. And Mamaneng in Johannesburg is one of those very, very few racially mixed neighborhoods, and it always strikes me as ironic that the very architects who throw stones at Hallmark House live in exceedingly comfortable suburbs, yep. which are you know, generally free of people of color except the servants. Mm. But you've been speaking about this anomaly for a long time. Mm. And you've spoken about civic projects as being this kind of mixture of humility and determination. Mm. Can you expand on that a little? Well, I, I, I think that there is um, an opportunity in all projects beyond, beyond the uh, the nature of the brief. I mean, Hallmark was taken because of a kind of reading of Johannesburg as this apartheid city. And, and the kind of this, you know, and Johannesburg is, I mean, quite a lot of cities are kind of apartheid cities, but informally, and Joburg is a formal construction of apartheid. Um, I kind of argue that even New York is an apartheid city, the way Ed Moses kind of used infrastructure to divide the poor and the rich. Um, but, um, I, I felt that somehow this idea of being able to talk about um, where people should live and what constitutes a good neighborhood was, was, a, was a fascinating one that Jonathan had started and one that I thought that as a, one could bring um, an architectural kind of conversation to. And you know, the project was done with no money. It's mm -hmm. literally, it wasn't about, and it wasn't really about kind of crafting a sort of special object, but it was about this idea of saying that, that actually we really need to think about this idea of where the territories are and what is comfortable and what is not in the city. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why I, I did that project um, for that very reason of really thinking about you know, the heart of the city which has been kind of excavated and is yeah. a kind of burnt hull. Um, but that that actually can be a destination. I mean, it's for me a little bit sad. The failure is that it's a kind of island. Mm -hmm. and, but I hope that it actually becomes something that uh, rekindles a kind of an idea of being able to do that. And I think that, I mean, apart from the racial issue, just the idea of a kind of the, the notion of a city constructed for five, six million people or something like that being empty and not being used to its full capacity mm. seemed just as a kind of architect criminal to me. Yeah. That actually, that prejudice can be so, so, so powerful that actually you would abandon an infrastructure that is designed to create an incredible density and support network because mm. of fear. Mm. Um, uh, and, and you know, I think that that's part of the kind of super complexity that, that is something that I think South Africa is really dealing with this notion of the fear. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's very interesting because this particular development has had a number of signature architects. There's been yourself, there's been low tech, yeah. there's, there's a few of them. And now what we're seeing in the city is a lot of people coming into the city and taking selfies against the buildings. Yeah. And so somehow there's this symbol of these buildings as being city in a city that's been completely, as you say, kind of eviscerated. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think it is actually a success. It, it's taking a long time because of that fear barrier. Mm. But Mabaneng today is a very different place than what it was completely. 10 years ago. Yeah. And I mean, if, if, if you fast forward to, to 2018 and your most recent commission in Ghana, the cathedral, which has you know, brought the issue of architecture to the fore, actually in a way that I've rarely seen in Accra. And it's the first time I think I've heard a Ghanaian politician, I'm talking about the president, um, Akufuado, use architecture in you know, the manner of a Mitterrand or, a, or, mm -hmm. a, or an Nkrumah since um, independence. Yeah. And the reaction from the general population has been mixed. And I think, yes, of course, yeah. you know, there's an issue about cost. But as is so often the case in Africa, money is not the real issue. No. It's the kind of mask that you know, allows a whole range of other issues to emerge. What would you say some of those issues are? No, I think that there's a kind of, even with the population, there's a kind of, um, you know, Africa's a continent, and these countries are continents of extremes. So there is a, there is the kind of, there is the indigenous cultures and the sustenance cultures that kind of live on the land. 
And then there's a kind of projection from the city about the relationship of poverty uh, in terms of developmental uh, sort of ideas. So in, in a way, there's this, then there's this kind of strange kind of confliction that somehow one day those people will become exactly like us. And until that moment, we're kind of a poor country. And so if we're a poor country, we have to behave a certain way. We have to kind of deal with handouts and, and you know, should be investing in wealth. So th then at the same time, you know, there's a 787 landing. You know, um, the government's kind of trying to negotiate deals with countries about all these things. And we're sort of forgetting that the idea of the, the idea of the sort of nations on the continent are going to be, a, it's going to be a different model. It's not going to be the model that we've seen. It's going to grow differently. It's going to grow at its own pace. But what is fundamental is, you know, after, you know, 57, Nkrumah's kind of incredible, and him and the sort of gang of six who kind of liberated, for me, the continent, not just Ghana, is that there's this idea of what is the national project? And the national project isn't just saying I'm Ghanaian, Nigerian, or whatever else. It's the idea of investing in the notion of a modern infrastructure that allows the population to grow and flourish and to fulfill themselves and their, uh, you know, fulfill their lives on the continent. And Nkrumah was very explicit about that. You know, and in less than a decade, he built almost the infrastructure that is still in use 60 years later. And what's extraordinary to me about this president and his ability to use architecture, but the fact that somehow there's a criticism because the country is uh, poor, so you can't do it. It's very interesting. The same thing happened to Oscar Niemeyer when they were building Brasilia, by the way. I mean, it was kind of like trashed as this kind of absolutely ridiculous project in a country that was, you know, Bankrupt, too poor yeah. to kind of do this. But actually, it was about that what it did was activate a certain kind of ability for the country to kind of imagine a new future. Mm -hmm. Same in Mexico in mm -hmm. the 50s, you know. Um, so in a way, what this president is trying to do is to understand that architecture is part of the infrastructure that sets up the DNA of the, the idea of a nation. Yep. Yeah. And he's interested in using that. And I think it's, it's interesting to me that it's not since it's been, I mean, there isn't a single African leader that I know of that speaks about architecture. And for the first time, positive or positive and negative, in Ghana, there's a huge, huge debate, debate about, about it, yeah. our architecture. I mean, and, and it's, you know, and you realize that people have, are completely in a new area where they don't really, you know, know how to kind of process the information and to deal with the fact that actually, you know, this is part of the kind of quadruple identity that an African has to have. You're, you're poor, you're metropolitan, you have a European kind of agenda, you have a kind of African agenda, you know, like you're in this kind of, you're not in the Du Boisian double, you're in a quad of like, you know, a poor, and, yeah, past, present, future, rich, poor, you know, local. I mean, just to talk a little bit more conceptually about some of your work for a few moments, yeah. and, and one of the issues that immediately comes to my mind is, is this issue of skin. Mm. And for you, let's say, unlike, I don't know, Herzog and Demuron or, or some of the Swiss um, facade specialists, and I hope there's no Swiss in the audience, I can think of immediately, the skin of a building in your buildings is never thin, it's, it's never surface, but it's always volumetric in the sense that, you know, living skin, kind of textured skin, scarred or tattooed skin has, has, has always been a really important material, particularly in African culture. And do, does this reading form part of your repertoire? I mean, where does this fascination for the skin come from? Um, I think that it's, if you uh, sort of think about it through the lens of the skin, you're using, um, uh, you're using a narrative which comes from a kind of sort of Semperian conversation about, you know, architecture is textile, etc. I'm not really interested in that narrative, and I'm not really interested in skins, but I am interested in an, ar an architecture that sort of breathes, mm -hmm. and, and breathes and mediates. And I, I tend to kind of think about it as a device which is mediating, breathing, uh, representing. Um, and so this idea that somehow that one can expand architecture or expand the skin from 300 or 400 mil to two meters, through um, and, and from that to then allow it to have the complexity that we have in the world right now um, uh, in terms of perception and how it kind of mm -hmm. operates in terms of how it registers. For me, is was a way to kind of activate the potential mm -hmm. of architecture to more, better align with the complexity that we have in our cosmopolitan and metropolitan life. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, if it was about skins, it would be graphic and linear yeah, and representational. 
it's really not for me. And it's not even about, it's really about how do you, I'm actively interested in how you um, understand the notion of a kind of tropical response, which is somehow, if you think about the kind of work of you know, post-war architects in dealing with it in the tropics, this idea that somehow there has to be another architecture which starts to create a mediation between climatic kind of um, zones that you would kind of make between the outside, the threshold, and the inside, and all the kind of expansions that you can make in it. I think that it, it actually allows for a way to kind of think about architecture which goes beyond just thinking, thinking of it as um, opaque and, mm -hmm. and translucent kind of apertures on walls. It's, it's really a way to think of architecture as a device that is continually mediating and dissolving as much as possible to the edge to be the device which is then talking about where the threshold is and where it isn't. I'm sort of very interested in that and even when I'm making, um, where I'm having to make a wall, I'm sort of trying to think about that. And that is how one is choosing materiality, one's choosing the sort of techniques and the, and, the, and, the, and the thinking. The complete opposite in the sense of pattern making. I have no interest in pattern yeah, making, yeah. even though they become patterns. It's not really, that's not the start. And I mean, in, in 2017, you were appointed patron of the, the Africa Architecture Awards, which have now been put on hold whilst the organizers look for a credible sponsor. But the level of entries and interest in the awards was absolutely outstanding. I think there was something like 320 entries from 34 countries. And, and bearing in mind the growing profile of African architects over the past decade, do you think that award programs like that are, are, are important? I, I think they're critical. I mean, I think in any, I think for the continent especially, um, I think this idea of being able to have a visual of what, um, what young practices, mature practices are doing and to have that as a kind of, a, as part of the public consciousness is, super, is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. And to not, I mean, we are in a situation where not just to have that as part of the consciousness of people on the continent, but just globally in a kind of interconnected world where we're all trying to make sense of things. I think the kind of projection onto places that are apparently underdeveloped mm -hmm. comes when there's a lack of imagery that's coming back the other way. way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it, there's no resistance. So it's very easy to make terrible mistakes on the continent because actually there's no... Nobody's looking. There's yeah. nobody's looking, yeah. 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 And I think that you've got to, you've got to send the narrative back, mm. which then allows a kind of mediation and a, think, a, cl a clarity about intention when one makes projects. Mm. Yeah. I mean, in, in many of the, the conversations that I had with students after your visit in Johannesburg, they, they, they were most impressed by the way that you talked about failure, mm -hmm. not necessarily success. Mm. And, I'm, and I'm aware that's a you know, really terrible cliche about all successful people. But, and I'm probably misquoting you here, but you did say something, or, or you seem to draw a line between professional and personal failure, which you, I think, said were two very different things. And in, in 2009, when mm -hmm. you know, the firm's financial woes were splashed, and I have to say somewhat gleefully across the headlines, mm -hmm. I, I remember you saying that the worst part of that was you having to tell your father. Yeah. And it was a very poignant admission, and I think it was one that the, you know, the students took in enormously, they, they took it very much to heart. Can you say a little bit about, a little bit more about that? No, I mean, I mean, I think I was also trying to hint at that. It's ironic that in, in your career you sort of think that the things that you are going for, or presenting, or or pitching for, are the things that are really going to define your career. And actually, in a way, it, it's or are going to be the things that kind of allow you to get to that place where you understand what it is that you're trying to do. But sometimes it's, well, I don't think sometimes, almost 90% of the time, it's actually the opposite. It's the things that you don't win, it's the things that mm. actually don't work, that actually are the kind of greatest catalysts to the next kind of place. Um, because in a way, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting, me nearly losing my business made me kind of become absolutely conscious about the idea that if I was interested in it as a sustainable model, I had to change. And if I was interested in this as a career, I had to change. Um, and you know, the pride problem um, of, you know, and pride is the kind of worst character of thinking that, you know, I just don't want to fail. <laughs> um, and you know, especially, I mean, for me at that time, it was really, you know, my, my parents had spent a ton of money, you know, educating me and I just felt like, you know, doing architecture was already like taking them left field. They didn't really know about architecture. And I just felt like I was going to sort of 
it was going to vindicate any kind yeah. of conversations that were had with friends about, you know, why doesn't he become why, a doctor? Why does he become a doctor? Because it's yeah. he's smart enough to become a doctor. Like, yeah. what the hell is he doing, being an architect? And so that that was traumatic for me because the repercussions of that was that it was just like you know, see, um, but actually he was. I, it was all in my head, of course. Um, he was extremely proud of me, um, and you know, I'd been incredibly supportive. But this idea for me that. That you know, in my in my work now, I realize more and more that actually, you know, sometimes when we when we lose when we lose competitions, I realize, oh, you know, maybe that's that that idea needs more work. Mm -hmm. That project needs more work, and it's really interesting to me now, you know, practicing for nearly twenty five years, um, that actually there are certain thoughts that I started working on, you know, fifteen years ago that are just finding Therefore, their articulation yeah. now. Yeah in a confidence that kind of allows me to kind of be able to, and I don't mean I'm literally taking a scheme and bringing it yeah. forward, but the kind of, the thinking that kind of was birthed at a certain point around a certain issue has taken that long to get to a point where I can now articulate it within conditions. So I'm sort of very, very much into this idea that somehow that, you know, sometimes when you lose things, it's kind of saving you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Saving you from, from yourself, from yourself. Yeah. <laughs> that you just overproduce. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you need to reflect. And we took the um, precaution of actually asking a few um, people to bring in some questions. Great. Partly because in, in situations like this, somebody can suddenly go off on left tangent and then you'd be you know, chasing a rabbit hole. Yeah. So we've got about six or seven questions that sure. um, I, I hope you won't mind us asking. Of and this one comes from Stephen Ehwe. And he says, I would like to ask about the future of development in Africa. What can we do about development in rural areas? Do we create institutions that educate people on building systems so they can be empowered to build better homes? How do you see this happening? Um, I, I think this falls into that kind of, again, this, this idea of a certain image of what modernity is. And I've, I've spent a lot of time you know, getting rid of this idea that the whole world is going to look a certain way, and that you know, I am I'm more interested in a, a rural community, if they want to be rural, to stay rural and to kind of to invisibly um, enhance that rural quality because it's 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 giving a certain quality of life. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, if that if a young person wants to move to the city, they move to the city. But I think what's more interesting for me is not that you go into a rural community and say, build better homes, but you go into a rural community and, and give them the tools that allows them to kind of live that rural life the way they want to live it. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, you know, if somebody wants to live in a rammed earth house with a kind of an ecology of thatch and to live on the land and to have their sustenance from the land, it. so be it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and how do we help you do that? Um, you know, what is the infrastructure of sanitation, et cetera, that maybe isn't? Um, kind of developed because suddenly you've got an influx of density and that's changed your ecology and you don't have the kind of... So I'm kind of interested in that kind of development and in, in the cities, I think that it's absolutely up for grabs because what is the nature of an African metropolitan city is still evolving. Yeah. It has a complex set of pieces from, you know, colonial to post-colonial to the kind of modern world that we're sort of now in. But that is all being formed and so that there is an opportunity to have an identity, you know, some people say there's an identity now to the Middle East, there's an identity to Asia, there's an identity to America that's different to Europe. Well, we're, we're at that moment where we're trying to create the identity of what the continent in its metropolitan image can be. And if, if that isn't actively taken up by people who have empathy with the continent, that will be lost because yeah. it will just become a simulacrum of everything else. Yeah. So it's an exciting time, I think, to build on the continent. So this is coming in from Abigail, and she says, my name is Abigail Joseph, and I'm a sociology student based in London. And I can only imagine how many questions will be sent in, and I hope that mine will be chosen. So, Abigail. <laughs> and it's about your Sugar Hill project, and she says, I love many of your pieces, but this is my favorite. And she says, I often think of the Grenfell Tower fire when we see how the quality and safety of social housing can be compromised to save money. And working on a relatively small budget for Sugar Hill, yet creating holistic social housing with early education services, as well as a museum provided, and critical thinking even being applied to the windows. How is it possible to have more Sugar Hills? I mean, I know that these are enormous questions. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, you know, 
Sugar Hill was important, and what is great about Sugar Hill is that the mayor of New York sort of took it up as a blueprint for his teams. So, I mean, what Sugar Hill has done um, is that it's actually um, made a city realize that it actually has to deal with a kind of fundamental infrastructure, not just a capital, capitalist sort of infrastructure of retail around housing, but the fundamental kind of uh, composition of parts that allows for a community to grow out of high density living. Um, and so like on, on all the new projects, there's a kind of discussion about what is the support for ecology that has come from that. And Sugar Hill was, has become a, a model of, that, of yeah. that. So, you know, I mean, we do, I, I do projects, other architects do projects that push that sort of agenda. I mean, we push that mix and we, we worked with the city to kind of override code issues in America to kind of allow us to do certain things on that building. And we do that so that, you know, for me, architecture is about this continual remaking. And the remaking has to always, it questions the rules and it allows the rules to get better and it allows architecture to get better. That's the point. It's, it's you know, as Zaha would say, it's, you know, it's continual experimentation. Yeah. But experimentation isn't about style. Experimentation is continually testing and making things better for the world that we want. Mm -hmm. For me, it's not an image, it's an idea. It's about continually. I mean, it's slightly um, off tangent, but I, a mutual yeah. friend of ours, Issa Diabate, always talks about yeah. architecture being mission creep. <laughs> that you kind of start with one idea and then very slowly, mm. you know, it, it kind of expands. And I think we're taught to think of it as the, the wrong way to do it, that you try to close, you know, hold on to it. But yeah. actually, you're talking about a much more expansive idea yeah. of practice. Yeah. And it, well, I mean, I think that that level of practice can be deeply rewarding because it's continually, mm. you know, whether failing or not. I mean, and you try not to fail because it's a lot of money and it's, just, you know, but I mean that somehow this idea of continually trying to move past the familiar to kind of allow others to also understand something yep. new mm -hmm. is a critical part of 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 the kind of the kind of engagement mm -hmm. um, to make to make the so I'm going to ask one more question from our bunch and then I'm going to open it a little mm -hmm. bit to the audience. Um, your your earlier work comprised a series of residences, <coughs> domestic spaces, and studios for artists, mainly mm -hmm. in London's East End, and they were reconceptualizations of lived-in environments mm -hmm. and they explore the relationship between private space and the city. Mm. How do you go about those kinds of projects? It's a slightly odd question. Mm. In the way that you experiment with form, natural light and materials, those have become the kind of DNA of the practice. And I'm thinking mm. particularly of the, the project in King's Cross, which was very a black the interior. interior and it yeah. was I mean, an, an incredible building to be in because it was all about kind of reflection, not really knowing where you were, can you talk a little bit about those kinds of projects? What do they allow you to do? Um, well, I, those projects were all about trying to find a position about why we were making things in the city. It was a couple of investigations, really. The early, the early projects for me were, I was fundamentally kind of concerned with this question of why do you actually do something? So it wasn't about a kind of, okay, we just need to keep doing things. It was like, why do you do something? And then, um, what is the what is the what is the the impact of that thing on the user and what it's trying to do? So, for instance, the the house, um, and it was actually for Roxanda uh, Roxanda Lilich, the uh, the designer, um, and it was really a kind of an experiment with her to create a kind of a world in this in this place that was um, somehow. It was a very large volume, but it was this idea of somehow creating a space where, you know, in my mind, the, the idea of light would be kind of understood as a kind of form that you could physically engage with, not a reflection, not a diffusion in most houses which are bright. It's about diffusion. You don't know where the source is because it's all about refraction and reflection to create even lux levels. And it was to see if we could make a house which was more like a landscape. Mm that actually you would have the kind of, you would have intense shade and intense light, that light would be physicalized, and that reflection and the way in which the kind of complexity of that um, would be something that you could continually enjoy. It wouldn't be a theatrical experience. It would be something that you would live in yeah. and have a decade with or yeah. the rest of your life. And what would that do to you? And you know, she is a fashion designer. I was very interested in the, and she has a very kind of powerful kind of understanding about color and the way color works. And, and that whole sort of, sort of thesis that I sort of 
sort of opened up with her was about that. It was like, how do we, you know, in response to your question to me about how does she, you know, she said to me, I want to kind of work with color, and this is what I'm doing. I said, well, let's make a house where actually we don't have any of this kind of distraction, but actually the kind of the, the physicality and the perception of light and color becomes absolutely essentialized. And we have to neutralize all the kind of perceptions that you're going to deal with. And she started to do her shows there, and then you know, it became a very important touch point for her. And it, it also became a very important project for me because it allowed me to explore um, um, this other side um, of the modern experiment which was not about, you know, um, that it, this idea of an architecture where the focus is on the physicality of light as a phenomenon rather than the reflection and the diffusion of light as a system to illuminate. Mm -hmm. So I became very interested in the idea that darkness would be dark <laughs> and that light would be light and that actually the negotiation of the body in that would create a kind of an emotional state that was a kind of reboot to kind of some kind of essential quality. And that was interesting as a, as a kind of worthy thing to look, look at at the beginning of the 21st century when we were brilliant at doing reflective systems. Sure. So um, I promised uh, Manisha that I wasn't going to go on until midnight. So I've got one more question. And then I think we can probably take a couple. One? OK. So um, I'm going to make this my last question, um, that we began this conversation with Mabel's dictum, begin with the past, where would you like to end? Oh, God. <laughs> How can you ask me that? <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I think that, I think that if, um, if, if I've sort of, I hope I've tried to make clear that I'm interested in the journey, not the beginning or the, or the destination. And I, I, I kind of hope that my life, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm completely <laughs> interested in, in how my life can somehow, uh, the fulfillment of what I do is in the ability for my life to kind of take me through a journey to, to unveil a quality about living on this planet at this time, you know? And I mean, I, you know, that is kind of maybe at its base why I'm doing architecture, that it sort of, it forces you to go to clients that you just would never know or meet. It forces you to engage in cultures and worlds that you would not in your ordinary kind of world kind of encounter. And then it forces you to make things that sometimes are beyond what you sometimes think you mm. actually are capable of making. Um, and it moves you into situations that you would not ordinarily find yourself. And I think architecture has this incredible ability mm. to do that. Mm. And um, to be able to kind of have that and then to construct forms that become the kind of evidence of that, that maybe also shift people's lives is, is the most fulfilling thing. And that's, you know, that's what the thing is about. That's an in incredibly profound act in that sense, like in the, in the original meaning of the word profound, it affects you on all levels. Yeah. 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 So can I take one question, if there is one burning question <laughs> one. from the audience? <laughs> Just one. And I have to say, in Johannesburg, we did the same thing, and the question came up, what should Africa do? So please don't ask that question. <laughs> Who's going to decide who takes who gives the <laughs> Spotlight's okay. on you. Um, as an architect, oh, wow. um, as an architect, who do you, or even when you're studying, who do you look up to? Because as a young black man trying to get into the industry, I don't really see many faces but yours. So who did you look up to when you were in my position? I, I think that's a very valid question. And I'm, I mean, I hope one that will fast not just be about me, but it, you know, a lot. There are many others coming, um, but yeah, I try to find. You know, I I I dived into this idea of moving outside of the the, the narrative that I was being taught. So I, you know, how I found an ability to kind of have inspiration was to look at the work of Indian architects um, and what they were doing around independence, and, you know, or Mexican architects and what they were doing, or Japanese architects, and this idea that to move it away from about being about culture, color to being about culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that for me, looking at inspiration through how culture does things in different parts of the world is a really important way, if you feel isolated, to feel that actually you're not isolated. There are, just, there are many ways in which architecture can manifest itself and um, find the source. Mm. Great. Well, 
thank you, everybody, and thank you again to Vitra and the RIB. This has been amazing. Thank, thank you. you.